Welcome to Study Buddy, meditation philosophy for the heart of your practice. This is a live online discussion of ancient yogic texts amongst meditation practitioners in the Shambhavananda yoga tradition. My name is Acharya Satyam, a resident teacher at Konalani Yoga Ashram in Hawaii, and I welcome you with love and respect. Hey everyone, thank you for being here. All right, it is uh, that time of year when um, you might find yourself around a campfire. And um, it's getting to be that time of year, right? Not out here in Konalani. Here our campfire is um, the Yagya. Yeah, so where we roast our karma. Um, but tonight, in tonight's sutra, we're gonna learn the secret of being the best fire tender about keeping the best well-lit campfire going in our hearts in order to grow in the most virtuous possible way, in order to grow the most uh, in our day. So that's a, a little, just a little taste of what we're going to work on tonight. Um, and of course, we'll start though by getting grounded in our body and in our breath and in our seat um, with the baya. So you might have to scoot over a little bit. Hi, uh, take a moment to um, start to wiggle in your seat a little bit and feel your shoulders rocking back and forth. Your head can gently bobble and imagine with this little gentle um, movement that tension is starting to slide off of you. You might even feel physical tension release as you give yourself the opportunity to relax and melt. And then as the mind relaxes and melts, maybe some bigger chunks of tension can start to fall away from the body. And then come to stillness for a moment. And maybe you can even still feel that little rocking, kind of like after you get off a boat and you still feel the sea beneath you. Take one shoulder and start to very gently roll it up and back, not full range of motion. We want this to be gentle. And then the other shoulder. Bring your awareness underneath your shoulder blade on the back of the body and see if you can just visualize it sliding gently up and down the rib cage, giving the back of your heart a little massage. And that looks really nice, Nanda Devi. We can copy her and let her head start to follow that movement, turning from side to side, if that feels good. And then gently come back to center. Allow the shoulder blades to relax completely. But notice if there's just a little extra support underneath the shoulder blades where they connect to the ribs, release your hands down to your sides and turn the palms face out. You can't see my palms, but they're face out with those same relaxed shoulders. Start to reach the hands out and let this be as weightless as possible. Perhaps the arms stop at a T or they can keep going if that feels nice and there's no tension in the tops of the shoulders when you do that. And Take a natural breath here and imagine you're like a little kid and you're really excited about something. Let your heart open, sparkle your fingers a little bit. And gently start to gaze up, letting the whole front of the body expand. And then bring the hands together overhead and draw them to heart center. Take a breath at the heart and Imagine all of your focus dropping into the center of the chest. Watch your next couple of breaths from the heart. And then we'll do all of that just one more time. So relax the hands down and start with the back strokes with the shoulder blades and notice if it feels a little more natural the movement can be a little bigger this time if that feels good but it doesn't have to be 
And then come back to center, soften the shoulders and feel any spaciousness in the shoulder joints. Release the hands to the side, flip the palms and gently start to reach the arms out, letting them weightlessly float up any amount. And then pause at the top of whatever feels comfortable and spacious for you. Take a couple of breaths, getting more expansive. And then hands come to touch and let everything sink down into the heart. Drop the hands into the lap or whatever is comfortable. And from our heart center, we can begin. Let's give this sutra a shot. Is uh, the audio okay? Just before I get going to her. Thank you very much. Um, sharira vrittir vratam. Sharira vrittir vratam. Sharira vrittir vratam. The yogi's virtuous behavior is the maintenance of their body. The yogi's virtuous behavior is the maintenance of their body. <laughs> so this uh, sutra seems to be very specific, the maintenance of the body. But as we've seen in previous sutras, the body is not just the physical body that we have, although it does definitely encompass that. Um, it's not just the physical body. It's really your body of karma. It's, it's really the, your relationships, your job, um, your hobbies, your health, your well-being. All that is, is your body. It's the body of work that is your life. Um, and the maintenance of that, we've been talking about this for weeks, maybe even months, is that the maintenance holds this huge capacity for growth that when we start to actually invest in that maintenance phase of our practice, we see tremendous returns because you're actually investing in the bulk of your practice, as opposed to just starting like a new practice, you know, as we know, uh, a, a lot of one foot holes dug, maybe don't ever find water, but one dug really deep uh, finds it, as we've been told, you know, by Babaji numerous times. And so an analogy that's used in this sutra that I was really excited about, it's, not a, it's, it's, a, it's a familiar analogy, um, is that of a fire. And we are shown this quote. Just as flames, maybe it is plural, just as, flames are, uh, just as a flame arises out of kindled fire and gets dissolved in the sky, so also Atma, the self, like a flame, having burnt down the fuel of the body, gets absorbed in Shiva. This quote was from a footnote in the Jayadeva Singh commentary, and I was grateful for it because it brought a, a slightly new perspective to the classic analogy of the fire that we're familiar with from doing fire ceremony, yagya. Um, the logs are the body, but again, the body is a concept of, uh, it's the physical plane, it's your life, your daily life, your daily activities. The flame we know is our practice. And what I really enjoyed about this expansion of the metaphor um, was that Shiva is the sky. And so it's like, we are these logs and through our practice, we literally merge with the sky of Shiva, it's literally the log becomes the sky. And this uh, sutra in particular is, is focusing on this concept of virtuous behavior. So it's clicking back. 
virtuous behavior. Okay. And so we are told and we're taught here that the, vir the most virtuous behavior is not necessarily related to having the biggest or most fashionable logs in your fire. Seems so obvious when you're talking about a fire as a metaphor, but um, not so obvious, you know, when you're living it in your life. We're told that the real virtuous behavior is simply keeping that fire burning. That's the only virtuous behavior there really is. We're actually told later that Shiva uh, sort of bestows blessings to the fire in us, not to the logs. And if your the campfire has too many logs in it, Shiva is actually like, hmm, but we'll get to that later. So let's take a closer look at virtuous behavior as defined by the sutra here in this next quote. Um, sitting close to the camera, do you want to call on somebody? Oh, Pujari. Thanks. Yeah, do you want to give this a read for us? That way. Wait, this way. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a two-part quote. I will change the slide when you get to the next part. Now? Action. What is virtuous behavior? <laughs> For ordinary beings, virtuous behavior may involve special ways of acting and being. For example, there is special behavior that some people observe during the eclipse of the moon. These people fast and perform special ceremonies during the eclipse and continue these special actions until the eclipse has ended. But for such a yogi, behaving virtuously is just to remain in his body as it is. This is because while he remains in his body, he is intent only on performing the supreme worship of Lord Shiva in each and every action of his life, while eating, while drinking, while talking, while taking tea, while eating lunch, and so forth. Although everyone around him experiences that he is acting just like an ordinary human being, he is not. He is somewhere else. Thanks, Pujari. I know that was a long quote, so it's hard for everybody probably to reprocess the whole concept, but um, see if you can read through it a little bit on your own. And um, I apologize, I usually have time to go back in and change the he's for they's. I, I did not have time today and I apologize, but just assume it's obviously talking about us all. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with observing a, an eclipse. Isn't there one coming up right tonight? Bye -bye. Yeah, so that's fun. Let's all watch the eclipse tonight. No, shouldn't miss it. Um, but in the terms of the sutras, oh, did I see a hand? All right. Oh, it's just right out there. Oh, is it like happening mm. right now? No, I don't know. Okay. I, 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 I'm not sure. Okay. But um, so yeah, enjoy the eclipse. But I, you know, what the sutras might be recommending to us is not to assume that uh, that sort of special moment somehow exceeds the capacity that we have every day in the 23 other hours of our day uh, to grow if we start to sort of treat our day as a little bit more special. Right. If we start to treat our, our day with that same kind of attention that we would give, that we will give tonight, perhaps this eclipse. You know, we all look ahead to a thing like an eclipse tonight. We know what time is going to happen. We sort of anticipate where we're going to be, how we can get ourselves into a viewing position of it. You know, sometimes that's literally all it takes to anticipate growth in your day, to see some of the uh, special events that are coming up and to uh, prepare for them on the inside, you know, and to use your day to, 
to also anticipate where the challenges are in your day or where the openings are for you to insert your practice. Thanks for this comment, Jaganmati. And always feel free to un un unmute if you want to say it, but I'll read it for you. Uh, Jaganmati reminds me of when Baba says we need to work. Sorry, my screen's a little uh, small. Here we go. Reminds me, reminds me of when Baba says we need to work on our own, not just depend on him at retreats and stuff, i.e. all the special ways. Good, good call on even bringing in that word special. Exactly. It's like the theme of this decade for us as practitioners, you know, is to learn how to find this maintenance aspect and to really like plug into it like it's like it's an eclipse, like it's that special. And it ends by saying, um, let me just click over for you all. It appears to the outside world that this yogi is merely going through their day, uh, but that is simply not the case. Um, the analogy of the fire comes up again in the sutra and saying, the logs are on the ground, but the flame is in the sky, right? So we're, we're performing our actions, but our awareness is up here. Now, the, the challenge presented by the sutra is, is simply that Sometimes when we get caught up in the logs and we forget about the importance of the flame, um, the fire gets smoky, the fire smolders, it sort of goes out. Um, and we're actually left with a pile of logs and we don't even have a campfire at all. And one more quote here about that. Oh, not your Johnny. Hey, could you hear it? Cool. Mm -hmm. The wise man is always marked with higher modes of yogic poses that arise from the body, i.e. while the body is retained. He alone is the real holder of yogic poses. The rest who only maintain certain gross poses of hands and the body are only holders of bones. <laughs> so awesomely cryptic. Thank you, Johnny. Holders of bones. That's a really great image. Oh, we, you, oh. So without our practice, even the, the finest logs in the world really don't amount to much. They're just a pile of logs. So we get to the uh, secret teaching of the sutra. How to maintain this fire. So if you've ever been in charge of the yagya uh, at Shoshone or, you know, at one of the ashrams or, you know, you know that you'll be sitting there uh, doing the mantras with everyone, maybe even like leading the mantra. Um, and simultaneously, you're watching that flame. And you want to keep it at just the right quality. So too many logs and the flame smolders and smokes too few and it might go out which is you know really big deal too big and everybody gets hot including you it's uncomfortable and too small you know and it starts to feel like the the party's over like oh i guess we're done with the mantras we must be wrapping up so it's like there's this quality to maintaining a really nice fire that requires a lot of focus, like a lot of attention. But it's this like, it's this extra attention that's going on in the background of your awareness. Even if it's like a campfire at a fun gathering, you might be having a conversation with someone, but if you're in charge of that fire, like you're always sort of watching the fire. 
And so as yogis, this fire is in our heart and it's just as real. And we're going about our day and we have to sort of keep one eye on this fire. And it appears to me, and we'll talk about this in a moment, that the, the, the sutra is encouraging us to sort of hold this fire in a very sort of, in a very internal way to, it really almost appears to be saying to keep your job as the fire keeper a secret, you know, to really like, let it be this internal quality and to maintain everything going on out here. Now, I, I want to talk about that. I want to see what you think about it. But first, let's read this, this part of the quote um, that refers to that, this aspect of the teaching. Hi, Anju. Will you read the quote for us? It is worthwhile, therefore, for a yogi to behave in such a way that he is not known as a yogi by the outside world. He must keep it a secret and not publicize it. He must be known to the world as an ordinary person. As long as he does not publicize his spiritual state, he is there. Otherwise, he is carried away from God consciousness. This is the secret of rising. Thanks, Anju. Why must we keep our practice a secret? What power could that possibly imbue our practice with? This is the topic of tonight's free write. So um, hopefully you have your pen and paper nearby as always. This is a regular thing. If you don't, maybe next time, uh, it is fun to, to write in the air with your eyes closed and to visualize your words. It almost works as good. All right. And so... We will uh, transition to that, just a couple of minutes. I'll, I'll tell you when we're getting close. So it's gonna be about three minutes. Um, so I, you might've already started writing, which is totally fine, but I just want you to take a moment to um, hold the space of this concept in yourself uh, to just let your attention sort of sink down, interesting already towards the heart, which already appears to be a bit of a secret place, if you consider it. And feel within yourself this concept of a secret. A secret means that you are in two places at once. It means that you see this reality and you simultaneously have knowledge of another reality. That's the definition of a secret. And that you're holding both of those realities within your being. In this very moment, there's a reality in front of you in the form of this class and the room that you're in and the life outside this room. There's a big reality happening. Simultaneously right now, we're trying to feel the other reality in our heart that is able to use this exact moment to find Shiva as a flame burns a log to find the sky. This practice that you can do in this moment essentially is a secret. No one really knows what you're doing to make this work. We've seen this in the previous sutras. The only, the, the state itself is the revealer. And so feel within yourself one more moment before we do any writing. Is your practice a secret right now? Does that make it real?
and see if you can retain this secret inner state as you simply write about it. You don't have to write anything special. You just start writing while maintaining that secret in your heart. And allowing yourself to finish the thought you're on. When possible, sitting the pen down, taking one breath. And then just reading what you wrote, underlining the the light. There's something in there that really stood out, I'm sure, a moment you felt, maybe even a key word. And as we're ready, sharing that key word in the chat box would be really fun. Staying inside. Heartful. Freedom. Normal. Understanding. Two. Inner awareness. Internal. Preserving our flame. Vibrations that have no sense. What's real is between you and God. Grow. Infinite exploration. Forgo. Sacred. Anybody here? Dream. Absorbed. Cool. 
would anyone like to open the conversation by uh, expounding on their their word? And three go like this. <laughs> Can I say something? Oh, sure. Uh, Dialin, I, oh, cool. Go for it. I don't see you, but I hear you. That's awesome. <laughs> um, well, you have this experience too, living in the ashram and being around Babaji a lot, but it's, it's, uh, there's a quality when you're like around Baba that in, when he's not in a teaching situation where you're kind of just left to guess like where <laughs> he's at, you know, you, you like kind of, you're like, I, at least I would find myself like wondering, like, where is he, where is he at? <laughs> if that makes sense. It's not like, it's like, he's obviously he's not bragging about it and he's not, it's, it's like, there's something internal that's his and it's not for me to know it's only for me to guess at hmm. so even though he's known as the guru it's like there's something secretive there absolutely and you know you bring up um the quote that i opted out of, of putting on it was at the very end of the sutra and i just thought oh you know that's that's enough quotes but the very end of the sutra says, um, even the disciple must not know the depth of their master's realization. The master must also hide their power of spirituality from the disciple. They must absolutely conceal their spirituality within their nature and not expose it to anyone. The disciple must possess and maintain blind faith. This is the manner of the Shiva sutras. Yeah, it's it, like you said, Dallin, it's sort of something that you're thrown into in the um, uh, the setting of just learning and living in the ashram, and you don't necessarily always have a context for it, but uh, as the sutras teach, it's, it's almost like a part of the tradition, this, this, this feeling that you're describing. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. um, Dialan, what you shared made me think of like when we're all in the lodge with Baba and then there's like a few guests and, and we're, you know, the Sangha is so connected inside and it's sort of like we're all in on the secret a little bit, you know, we're doing something externally, like we're maybe listening to Baba talk and turned and facing him, but we're all doing something else internally that's invisible and so I'm I just always like am amazed when there's other people around and it, it feels like oh wow we're all connected to this thing together but it's totally unobservable mm -hmm. um, sort of like Dayan right now <laughs> <laughs> wherever he is I'm sure he's looking at us I'm just floating in the ether. <laughs> it feels like that. Yeah, you know, and sometimes I've been, uh, I've even uh, remember when I first was would drive the car and like Bob would be in the car and I would drive like and I was really new to that. I would uh, actually in preparation for his time out here, just in case that was to occur. I, when I would be driving the car, driving, just driving anywhere, and I was the only one in the car, I would imagine like Baba was in the car just to like, be like, okay, here it is. It's happening right now. How are you driving? Like, how's it going? And, um, you know, it's almost like I would cultivate the secret and it made that ride like palpable. Like it was like suddenly like, whoa, okay. This is a, right now. This is a, this is a lot right now. Like driving the car with Babaji in it is a lot, and it's almost like that's the sutra is trying to say. Like if you can imagine, you can bring that level of reverence 
for your for your activity it elevates the experience to the very high state although i see unmuted please hey oh is that me or somebody else uh go for it okay um i was thinking uh with that quote that i personally i don't feel like i have any level of attainment to hide necessarily but i do feel like um i feel like i have some responsibility to to share some a bit about yoga to help people broaden their idea of what yoga is usually considered in our culture you know so i feel like in some way there's something to share you know even if it's not that that secret um so and i also sometimes feel that responsibility of how to approach that so it doesn't I'm, i don't want to preach to anyone or convert anyone but just to to help people know that there's more than just an asana class that there's more to it than just that Yeah, I think I, I, the beauty of this lesson is that it inspires like refinement of that very point where it's like, that's a point I think we, we, uh, you know, Bob is always telling us, somebody asked for a nickel, give them a nickel, somebody asked for a quarter, give them a quarter. And it's almost like knowing how much to give is a real art. And it's almost like for me in this suture, because I, uh, I think you bring up probably uh, you bring up one of the most valuable points of the sutra is that to know how much to give it's almost like we have to be coming from a detached place first otherwise we always give so much every time you know i was looking up these quote i was looking up for references in uh baba's books and he was like when i was younger in my practice i would just talk people's ear off about the practice and they'd look at me like what's wrong with this guy and I'm like, oh, I feel that way a lot, <laughs> you know, and especially in the early days. Uh, I'm like, oh, okay. So it's not just me. It's just like a, it's a normal part of the process. Um, so, yeah, I think that what you're bringing up is essential. Uh, and I think this is the path to it, as far as I can tell. Hey, Radharani. And if I miss anyone's hand, please feel free to unmute and just go for it. Okay. So um, thinking about, about this and keeping your practice kind of like uh, hidden or a secret, <laughs> I'm a very um, kind of like quiet and introverted person just by nature. So I tend to not share too much. <laughs> and I don't think I talk about my practice with anyone. I have friends good friends that they don't even know that I do meditation. I just have never come up. It's just, I'm, I and I sometimes I feel like a little bit like, I'm too, you know, like maybe I'm too close. But thinking about it today, it's just, and my word was freedom. I feel that it gives me the freedom to not feel obligated to fulfill anybody's idea of what someone who meditates is. Like it, it makes me nervous sometimes if I share something like that. Like everybody has their ideas of who a yogi, or a yogi, or a person who does yoga or meditation is, and it just I feel like uh, I don't have to fulfill anybody's, you know, ideas or needs or or judgment about that. And that's why I feel like it gives me that freedom. I just don't discuss it. It doesn't come up and uh, I am who I am. And uh, sometimes I feel like that, like, like people have an idea of who you are and they have their, you know, they project onto you. And I feel like nobody's projecting that onto me because they don't know I do it. <laughs> so that's, that was something that they come up when I was reading and uh, writing, sorry. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that gives me that freedom of being a yogi 
or an aspiring yogi with, uh, you know, evolving in my practice without having to fulfill anybody's uh, idea. Mm. And what I feel is like that will distract me from my real practice. That's like the main, the main thing that will distract me from going deeper. It's just that feeling of conflict there. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, in the analogy, it's just like the more we're focused on the logs, the less we're focused on the fire, there might be like a, an immediate trade-off kind of present in there. And, and then, you know, I, I really feel like, you know, what Rajani Ma was saying, it's like this balance and how do we find that balance, you know, and uh, is it about like not tell, like truly keeping it a secret, like, uh, like really putting your energy into that. Um, and is, you know, and, and maybe we feel that freedom from that. And then maybe we are pretty good at that. And suddenly we have to give a philosophy presentation, you know, and then we're like forced to suddenly work with that and so it's like our, it's like it feels like our karma will probably bring us opportunities to work outside of that realm and like we don't but i think a lot of the time we're we're reaching out um and so it it feels like the sutra is encouraging us to put a little bit more of our energy into this this possibility and again i'm i didn't obviously write these i'm practicing them right alongside with all of you um but to just see like does it somehow serve the situation and from a higher place for both them and, and us as we, as uh, radharani saying does it actually make the situation lighter does it actually make your practice better does it actually keep you from having i mean babaji just said in this week's satsang he was like his older maybe it was last week but it's recently his older brothers would be like well what do you think about this and he'd be like let me get back to you about that i don't know when i think about that yet and i was like wow i never thought i could respond <laughs> i was like that was the best response I've, i was like how did i never think of that response let me think about that anyway um and he just you know that's babaji's like method it seems so and it's really served him so I'm, you know, I'm excited to try it, but for those extreme introverts, you know, to us, maybe this might be something that's always served you. And like, it's like, you might know this teaching really well and your karma might actually, you know, ask something different of you. We're gonna meditate here soon. And I don't like to just end if anybody was just like really excited to share. Yeah, I think I'll say, um, to okay, kind of okay. piggyback on what Radharani was saying, you know, we kind of lead secret lives, don't we? And it's such a, um, a gift every once in a while when you are with a f somebody that's not in the ashram, but you can still feel that heat of that log burning a little bit, but they don't know that's going on. Mm. And I said the word too, because it seems like this sutra has two things going on. One, the practice of the log burning and, you know, eventually that space being merged with Shiva hood, which is such a beautiful image. And then there's the second piece, the two, the second, which is, you know, keeping it under wraps mm. a little bit. I'm definitely that way. That's just, you know, Andrea, <laughs> right? I'm Andrea, you know, yeah, it's right there. my best friends of 20 years don't really know what I do. Yeah, and so those two things have, a, according to the sutras, have a correlation, right? It's not coincidental. So I feel too that <clears throat> there's an aspect of, uh, when I'm thinking of the yogi that they're talking about in the sutra being kind of like an advanced yogi, um, to it's it's such an internal thing, 
and that's the world that they're enjoying and living in and to externalize it um, takes them can take them out of that place that they're in uh, and that's why to me it's like the seva the selfless service of the guru is to share because they're doing it even though it's taking them sort of out of to some degree it takes them out of where they're at to like come out if that makes sense um, to come out and try to connect connect people to that place is like a um can maybe take that even I, I don't know it's like a interesting thing because i've always had experiences teaching too where it makes me reach deeper inside but there's also an aspect of it that uh i think can be like externalizing when you're sharing it um i don't know it's kind of yeah, like maybe it's definitely in, in, a fine it's definitely a fine line and i think that this class sort of represents how how much work it takes uh to talk about our practice in a productive way you know it's like this very class is like it, it's like we're like learning how to do it in a productive way so yeah it does take a lot of focus and discipline thanks Dallin. So we can uh, transition for just the last few minutes, and I apologize. Uh, I always try to want to. I want to have the discussion so much, and then I, I know that the meditation is just as valuable. So um, I do encourage if you had another point, please uh, share it on the Marco Polo. I'd love to hear it. And so let's talk. We'd all love to hear it. So let's um, let's sit. Uh, let's allow your Allow your mind to get a little bit calmer. Sometimes, well, if you want to try this for fun, you can just sort of like bring your hand up to your forehead and just sort of draw like a little horizontal line and just sort of calm your forehead right here. And imagine that there's like a pond in your head or a lake and it's really still. This is like sort of the top of the lake there, right where the third eye is. You can just let the hand come down and then try to keep that lake perfectly still on the physical realm. And you can imagine the breath is, is sort of deep in the lake. These are the deeper currents way under the surface. <clears throat> and as you feel the breath churning in the chest, imagine you're at that, that bottom of the lake where, where it's nice and cool and calm, maybe a little bit less light. And this is sort of the secret area of the lake, <clears throat> excuse me. This is the part of the lake that it only knows about. And so try to let your breath flow in through the third eye, swallow occasionally, let the breath travel down the throat to the heart of this lake. Each time you exhale, let yourself sink down a little bit deeper and really feel the calmness. As the shoulders relax, as the body relaxes, your awareness really sinks. Perhaps the breath can be felt in the ribs without too much effort, with a very natural amount of effort. Perhaps it can be felt even at the navel. And 
you are the lake. You don't have to try hard just to get your awareness down there. It's a natural breath. Feel how so much of you is below the initial surface of the eyes and the ears and the mouth. You might even say 95% of you is below that. <clears throat> and that this 95% is your true being. And you can feel it by simply breathing there. And how you get there is a secret. How you go anywhere beyond your mind is a secret. The sutras say no one can truly tell you how to do it. Breathing into your heart and your navel, point the direction. Feel free to bring the mantra hum sa to the breath flow. Hum as you inhale, sa as you exhale. Translation, I am that. I am this being that is below the mind. I am this 95% inside. You can feel your breath. You can find a way there. The path is in your breath.
the path is secret. The breath is obvious, but the path through the breath is not. You have to find it. This is our work. This is your journey. How do you find that secret place inside? Right, as you open your eyes, you're offered the opportunity to retain your awareness in that secret abode of the heart. Nothing can distract you from it, and it's the highest, most virtuous behavior that we can bring to whatever ask, our life asks of us next, even if it's sleeping. Um, so have a great rest of your night, a uh, great weekend to come. Thank you all for spending this time. Namaste. And uh, as always, like I was saying, if you have a comment uh, that you didn't get to, I'd love to hear. We'd all love to hear about it in the Marco Polo. Uh, and if you start keeping this secret and actually affects your life, uh, it'd be fun to hear that discussion uh, continue. Oh, no uh, class week next week. It's Thanksgiving. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, see you in a couple weeks. Jai Jai